Hi there, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. We start the show with Ben Mankiewicz getting a behind-the-scenes glimpse at the making of a six-part documentary on the careers and marriage of megawatt stars Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. I fell more in love with them as I did it, and the more you care about them, the more you want to do the story justice. The director is an actor, four-time Oscar nominee Ethan Hawke, who landed the gig in a phone call from one of Woodward and Newman's daughters. She thought that somebody should make a documentary about her parents, and I was like, oh, definitely, that would be a great documentary. And she's like, would you do it? And I, I remember, I was like, oh, me? Why me? It's hundreds of thousands of pages. I'm trying to the words of Newman and Woodward themselves form the core of the documentary. The element that the kids gave me that I knew was gold was an abandoned memoir that Paul was writing in the mid-80s. There's much more on how the docuseries got made coming up later in the show. One thing that meets the myth of Paul Newman in the movie is his decision to burn the tapes. That feels like a Paul Newman move. Like, does the world need a Paul Newman book about Paul Newman? No. No. Yeah. And don't you love him for yeah. being for having the brains to go, who cares about Paul Newman? You know, he also burned his tuxedo in the driveway. I love it. He, he just decided, I'm not going to any more dumb events. You, you know, anytime, if I have to wear a tuxedo, I don't, I'm going to be dead someday, and that's not three hours I want to spend in my life. He had a form letter that said, uh, I'll give you money. I'm not going to your event. I, I want no more prizes. Then Elizabeth Palmer takes us to a nondescript cafe near Tokyo that just might have the cure for writer's block. The mood is serious. A handful of customers sit at workstations glued to their computers, watched over by Takuya Kawai, owner and, well, chief enforcement officer. A fee of about two and a half dollars an hour gets you fast Wi-Fi, air-cooled computer stands, and Mr. Kawai himself. <laughs> I try not to hover, he says, not to pressure them too much, but I check their progress every 30 minutes. Why did you write better and concentrate better here? I had a tight deadline, and of course I was paying for it. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. They're considered some of the last major stars from the golden age of Hollywood and perhaps an early example of an A-list power couple. But as Ben Mankiewicz learned, Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman's glamorous life together was more complicated than it might have appeared. Very good shot. You know, I got a hunch, fat man. I got a hunch it's me from here on in. He's Paul Newman. One ball, corner pocket. With those fierce blue eyes <laughs> and that flawless face. Tough luck, Ron Ann. With a hard earned reputation for playing flawed characters. Don't you ever ask? Well, the only question I ever ask any woman is what time is your husband coming home? Hey, maybe one night this week he can tell your wife you gotta see a patient. And do what? Go dancing. I bet you're a real cute dancer. She's Joanne Woodward, the oldest living winner of the Oscar for Best Actress. You got a thin skin is what you got. Their passion for their work. But the world belongs to the meat eaters, Miss Clara, and if you have to take it raw, take it raw. And for each other. I couldn't live that way. Lasted half a century. I'm just sitting here stark and naked as the day I was born. Not only were they megawatt stars. Does that open any interesting lines of conversation? Well. They were a Hollywood anomaly a happily married couple. But that part of their story is more fable than fact. We'll get to that later. They presided over sort of the end of the movies as the universal art form. The remarkable Newman Woodward story is told fully and told honestly, warts and all, in a six-part documentary, The Last Movie Stars, streaming on HBO Max. They were the last people who were treated at the beginning of their careers the way Gary Cooper, Catherine Hepburn were treated, and they survived. I fell more in love with them as I did it, and the more you care about them, the more you want to do the story justice. The director is an actor, four-time Oscar nominee Ethan Hawke, who landed the gig in a phone call from one of Woodward and Newman's daughters. She thought that somebody should make a documentary about her parents, and 
I was like, oh, definitely. That would be a great documentary. And she's like, would you do it? And I, I remember I was like, oh, me? Why me? What's the best part of being uh, Paul Newman's daughter? Probably the eyes. <laughs> Clea Newman is Joanne and Paul's youngest. If you look at my smile, it's mm -hmm. exactly mom's. And if you look at my nose, it's exactly dad's. It's yeah. like, I Clea thought a veteran stage and screen actor like Hawk would understand the pressures her parents faced. They were two really complicated people. They were in a really complicated business. It's hundreds of thousands of pages. I'm trying to the ask words of Newman and Woodward themselves form the core of the documentary. The element that the kids gave me that I knew was gold was an abandoned memoir that Paul was writing in the mid-80s. He had his best friend, Stuart Stern, interview all the most important people in his life, John Huston, Robert Altman, and people that he worked with. And Joanne. And, and Joanne. He even interviewed his ex-wife. Those interviews were recorded, yet you won't be hearing them, because in 1991, Paul Newman literally set the tapes on fire. The story is, is that he took them down to the dump and burned them. But he didn't burn the transcripts. And then I had this idea that what if I asked all my actor friends to play these parts and bring them back to life? I'm trying to turn it into kind of like a play with voices. A community looking back. George Clooney plays Newman. The glue that held Joanne and me together was that anything seemed possible. Clea Newman believes her father had a specific goal when he agreed to be interviewed. He wanted to dispel the myth that everything was perfect, that everything came easy. That's not the case. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Darling. Yes, I know. Paul and Joanne met on Broadway in 1953. Immediately, they were drawn to each other. At the beginning of their relationship, it was not a complicated conversation about who was the better actor. Everybody thought Joanne. Was the <laughs> yeah, actor. Is that right? <laughs> everyone. Including Paul. Including Paul. The Paul Joanne romance began as an extramarital affair. Paul had a wife and three young children. In the documentary, Paul's daughter Stephanie says the divorce was devastating for her mother, Jackie. I was a baby and had to watch my dad and stepmom ride off into the sunset with Hollywood contracts. And she wanted to be an actress. Yes, that's the perfect reaction. It was, it just is, it's an unbearable story. It's unbearable from Jackie's point of view. And I think the remarkable thing that I kind of admire about Paul Newman, when he set out to do the memoir, he asked his best friend to please go interview Jackie yeah, and get right. her side of the story. Paul and Joanne eventually had three children of their own. Joanne, in one of those interviews that Paul burned, read here by Laura Linney, expressed her bouts of ambivalence regarding motherhood. Somebody once asked me, what was it like to be home and raising your children and having a career and everything? And I said it was horror. You were guilty if you were on set because you should be home with the children. If you were home with the children, you thought, why am I not on the set? Why is Shirley MacLaine getting all those parts? And then she says, my children are all wonderful. I love them all and they are all individuals worthy of being loved. But if I had to do it over again, I'm not sure I'd have children. Actors don't make good parents. <laughs> and I thought as an actor myself, I needed to put that line in the movie. I think it was very hard for her to give up something that she was so passionate about. I don't blame her for that. But I'm still human and I'm her kid, so I don't think that she felt that way later in life at all. When they first married, she just won the Oscar. She's the star. And then she had to sit and watch her husband's career. Each year, I mean, you know, I, I put in the documentary, there's a shot of the Beatles arriving in America. They said, what do you hope to do? And they say, meet Paul Newman, you know? <laughs> you just do anything I say, huh? Well, I want to stay. You're a nut. Part of that fame was Newman's considerable sex appeal. Oh, boy, she knows exactly what she's doing. Which he suggested was pure Hollywood it. fiction. And he says, all of it is a myth. When people meet me, there's that initial excitement. <laughs> yeah. And they start to talk to me, and that it goes, yeah, goes the down the longer Sexual they talk interest to me. <laughs> just diminishes with each, each passing moment. I love you more than Only the two people who are involved know what binds that relationship together. Their marriage, the documentary makes clear, was a challenge. Paul's excessive drinking was their biggest hurdle. 
The kids call him a functioning alcoholic, but Joanne says they worked at it together. Joanne gave him his confidence. Joanne taught him to believe in himself. Joanne taught him to love himself. When somebody asked her why their marriage worked, she said, there's my ego and there's his ego and there's our ego. And when we're both in service of our ego, we can do anything. They worked together on 16 movies, five of them directed by Paul. Their relationship never stopped growing. Their art never stopped growing. They never stopped pushing themselves, finding new things that were interesting to them. But that, you're right, that's got to come from you. Joanne directed theater, Paul raced cars, and together... This is what Newman's Own is all about. They were exceedingly generous philanthropists. How much did they give away? Between 700 million and a billion dollars. But I don't really know. It's a lot. It's a lot. And the funny thing is, is that they probably wouldn't want anybody to know. Every hotel room we've stayed in since we came to Europe has a mirror. Well? Why does it always have to be right in front of the bed? Other countries, other morals. What they likely would want us to know is that they both did their finest work and became their best selves in the last act of their lives. I feel like we all need heroes that show the end of our life as a possibility of being the best part of our life. They never weren't holding hands, his arm around her. They were so in tune with each other. It was like what a good relationship can look like after you work really hard through the tough times. The toughest times came quickly. In 2007, Woodward, at 77, was diagnosed with dementia. Less than 10 days later, Newman learned he had terminal cancer. When my father was dying, my mother, she, she didn't want to be in the room. And so we were walking around in the living room, and then she looked at me and she said, I have to go to him. And she walked in and just grabbed his feet, and he took his last breath. You know, even in death, the last person he wanted to connect with was her. More exclusive excerpts of Ben Mankiewicz's conversation with actor-turned-director Ethan Hawke in just a few minutes. But up next, you might call it the Deadline Cafe. We've all been there with a deadline looming, but no inspiration in sight. Elizabeth Palmer found a quiet cafe along with a friendly but firm owner, and a little of your own money at stake might be the key to motivation. Tokyo's famous themed cafes usually feature animals. Cats, pigs, hedgehogs. The vibe is pleasure and play, quite unlike the newest edition that's all about work. On this busy intersection sits Tokyo's latest pop-up cafe. It's called the Manuscript Cafe, and it's for people who not only have a writing project, but crucially, have a deadline. Let's go see. The mood is serious. A handful of customers sit at workstations glued to their computers, watched over by Takuya Kawai, owner and, well, chief enforcement officer. A fee of about two and a half dollars an hour gets you fast Wi-Fi, air-cooled computer stands, and Mr. Kawai himself. <laughs> I try not to hover, he says, not to pressure them too much, but I check their progress every 30 minutes. Hiro Sekiguchi has come to write a lecture due tomorrow. On his registration slip, he's asking to be checked, or you might say gently harassed, every half hour till he's done. Writers are procrastinators. Faced with a blank page or more likely a screen these days, they'll find a million ways to avoid getting down to work. Well, not here. Kawai is making sure of that with Mr. Takahara, who's racing to finish a manga cartoon. Your aim was 24 pages, he says. How are you doing? Don't worry, he answers. I'm right on track. With the constant roar of traffic in a nondescript suburb, this place isn't what you'd call charming, except for the movie memorabilia and a wall of old technology in the bathroom. But what really counts here is getting it done. 
Part of the secret, says Hiro Sekiguchi, is the lack of distraction. I'm comfortable uh -huh. working here. Uh -huh. and, and focused. Yeah, focused. Greater Tokyo is the most populous metropolitan area in the world. So a quiet place away from this hustle to concentrate and create is precious. It's 20 to 4 in the afternoon, and Mr. Gucci behind me has finished. Mr. Gucci, Hi. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> How many hours did it take? One and a half, he tells me. Why did you write better and concentrate better here? I had a tight deadline, and of course, I was paying for it. Congratulations again. Thank you. What is interesting about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward right now? We'll have more from Ethan Hawke, who directed the six-part documentary on the lives of Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward, coming up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more from Ben Mankiewicz's conversation with Ethan Hawke on what he learned about the lives of Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman. So how did it come to pass that you, uh, Ethan Hawke, ends up directing this six-part docuseries on Paul Newman and, and Joanne Woodward? I ask myself that a lot. I Mysteriously, I went to the same high, last couple years of high school, I got sent to a boarding school, and Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's youngest was at the school. And I, I saw them walking across the campus one day, and I obviously was a big fan already, and it just kind of blew my mind that, he, that they were real, to right. see them with their kids walking across a high school campus. It was very strange. But I gather that Clea followed my career or something after that. We kind of knew each other. And my wife, who's my producing partner, she was like, you know, you should do this. You'd be right for this. And having made one documentary, I made a documentary called Seymour, an Introduction, which is about an 88-year-old piano maestro. And that was very small, and it was a ton of work. You do this for a living. Journalism is extremely difficult. Yeah. And that was a big learning lesson for me about how difficult. And I knew two people, 50-year careers, and it touches so much, um, you have a huge love story. You have the history of acting. Paul and Joanne were in an acting class at the actor's studio in the 50s with Kazan, Brando, Marilyn Monroe, James Dean, Geraldine Page, Ben Gazzara. I mean, you know, the, they changed acting. So there's that could be its own documentary. Newman's Own, they gave away hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Their political life could be a documentary. He also happens to be a four-time racing champion. You could make a documentary about that. It is so difficult to make one movie worth watching. And if you can make a bunch of them over 50 years, uh, you know, Paul won Best Actor at Cannes in the 50s, and he won Best Actor at Berlin in the 90s, forget the Oscar, I mean, just high level of work over a 50 year period. Joanne has the same thing. And so I knew it would be absolutely overwhelming and that there was no way I could do it. But I couldn't get the word no out of my mouth. Um, and so I just said yes. But it's not an ordinary documentary. Did Clea come to you and say, I want you to do a, a documentary on my, my folks? Or did she tell you the treasure trove that was here, that is the backbone of the story. I knew that Paul and Joanne are the, they came of age in the age of media. And I knew that there would be a ton of footage on them, you know? She had a bunch of home movies. She had access to something that was staggering, which was his attempt to write a memoir. In the mid 80s, he decided he was gonna write a memoir and he did a ton of interviews. He worked on it a little bit and then he decided he wasn't interested in it at all, but I had, transcripts of these interviews, and I knew that that was kind of priceless. I mean, interviews with Kazan, interviews with Robert Altman, interviews with some of the greatest names in the history of cinema. So I knew I had something special. My goal was to make a two-hour documentary, uh, just a normal, and then that quickly changed. But what makes this look like no other documentary, like no other six-part series, is the actors who you hired 
who are terrific actors, but that's not the key part. The key part is what they do, what you have them do. How did that idea, like, how did you pull that out? It wasn't an idea that happened, like, at one moment. Uh, it came out of a massive disappointment that Paul had burned all the audio transcripts of these interviews, and I was like, I, how can I make it without these? And then it was combined with an idea of why should anybody watch this right now? Like, what is interesting about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward right now? These careers happened a while ago. What, what is relevant? And then the more I talked to my friends, the more passionate they seemed about what there was to learn from the generation before us. And I started learning a lot from their passion. And I thought, I gotta get, I'll get my friends to read these transcripts and they can play the voices. And if this is, Clea had asked me, she wanted an actor's point of view, and I thought, well, what can I do that would be different than a professional document? Well, I can, I can offer an actor's point of view. One thing that meets the myth of Paul Newman in the movie is his decision to burn the tapes. Mm -hmm. That feels like a Paul Newman <laughs> movie. Like, does the world need a Paul Newman book about Paul Newman? No. No. Yeah. And don't you love him for yeah. being for having the brains to go, who cares about <laughs> Paul Newman? You know, he also burned his tuxedo in the driveway. <laughs> I love it. He, he just decided, I'm not going to any more dumb events. <laughs> you, you know, anytime, if I have to wear a tuxedo, I don't, I'm gonna be dead someday, and that's not three hours I wanna spend in my life. He had a form letter that said, uh, I'll give you money, I'm not going to your event. <laughs> I, I want no more prizes. Uh, did he know the tapes had been transcribed? Do we know whether he was aware of that part? He was aware. Stuart Stern, who was doing the interviews for him, is a fascinating person and we are indebted. The documentary is absolutely, he wrote Rebel Without a Cause. He met Paul and Joanne when they were doing live TV here in New York. Then he wrote Rachel Rachel, which Paul directed and Stuart, uh, Joanne was in and Stuart wrote. He, Stuart wrote Sybil, which was one of Joanne's great, great successes role, yeah. with Sally Field. He was one of their best friends and a great writer. And he, was, he knew they'd been transcribed, but he was just done with it. And Stuart came to believe that Paul actually did the whole enterprise to try to get Stuart writing again. Because Stuart was suffering really badly from writer's block. And one of the things that's in a lot of the interviews is Stuart said, of, you know, Kazan saying to Stuart, why is Paul doing this? It seems so unlike him. And Stuart's saying, I'm worried he's trying to be a good friend and he's just gonna burn these things after I'm done. <laughs> and of course, yeah. that's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and he literally went to the dump, poured gasoline yeah, on it, lit him on fire. his daughter fishing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is, a, that is, that's classic Paul. Really. Right. That's classic Paul. You know, you talk to restaurants in New York, there were two people that could get a table at any time. You know, the President of the United States and Paul Newman. Yeah. Uh, who, and the President changed, but he was consistent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.